great museum. I see that we have a lot of guests, and not just all from Oberlin, so we do welcome all of you here today. Um, we're just really honored. After last night spending some time with Dr. Gillian, we just I'm just really excited about our program today. So you didn't come to hear me talk, so I'm just going to talk, turn it over to Dr. Gillian and let her go from there. Thank you for coming to Oberlin.
lost, and, but Native American lives were also lost after heartbreaking moves by the U.S. government. Is Gilling ever right? No. But as historians, scholars, and community members, interested parties like we are here today, it's up to us to come to the truth about that event, uncovering new data in order to understand what, what the event was about. And that's what we're really to talk to you about. I imagine a lot of you are very familiar with this rape, but perhaps a little less familiar with one of the historians and writers that wrote about it, Mari Sandoz. I'd like us to consider some of what Sandoz did, and perhaps work to apply it in our own historical quest, realizing, of course, that there are many sides to history. As Lisa Lindell argues, Sandoz rewrites the traditional epic formula, taking the perspective of the dispossessed in the Lakotas and the Cheyenne, and recounts not the growth and expansion of culture, but its conquest. This is not common for writers of her time, especially women writers of her time, primarily writing from the 30s to the 60s. And as Lindell asserts, this is counter to what famed historian, more popularized of that era, Frederick Jackson Turner argued, quote, it depicted the frontier as the meeting point between savagery and civilization. So contrasting the Native Americans as a savage versus the civilized white man, uh, Sandoz was really trying to break down that stereotype. So let me provide a deeply personal example. As I mentioned, I'm from Durango, Colorado. I taught at Lewis College for seven years. I disconnects, oddly enough. Um, I knew we were named for the military post Fort Lewis, Camp Lewis, which was named for a former army man. Now, it wasn't until last week when I was at the Durango Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad. Has anyone been on the Durango Silverton train? Fantastic! Come back and see us. We'd love to have you. So in the fantastic free, free railroad museum they have there, and I see the sign about Lieutenant Colonel Lewis. And I'm like, huh, he died in 1878. I'm talking about that next week. It's really interesting. I'm like, where did he die? Well, Kansas. So there I am in the museum. Everyone's got their phone now searching what's happening. He died at that Scott City incident three days from before what happened here. So we have to, again, it really gave me the context to think about when you read about that Fort Lewis. That's the Lewis that we read about in Chapter 5 of Cheyenne Autumn. And what was interesting to me is I've taught at a school for seven years and didn't know that he was a part of that um, trying to control the Cheyenne during that time period. A lot of my students don't know, even know that. And considering that Fort Lewis is a school that provides free tuition for all Native Americans, it does in perpetuity due to its history as a, also a Native American boarding school. 33% um, of our population is Native American, yet I don't think a lot of my students know that we were named for one of the generals that was um, committing some of the atrocities that we saw. I know, it is a little bit ironic. I don't know whether to give this talk back there or not. I'm thinking about it, but we may become Western State Colorado of um, So in any case, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that we oftentimes get a history, but we don't know the actual history. My students think Fort Lewis is named for a camp, and they don't know that it's named um, for for the actual lieutenant. So we can be looking at the exact same event, the exact same data, and arrive at very different conclusions when we look at history. And that's kind of the fun part of history. It's like a mystery puzzle. You're going to be a detective and find new data to see the side of the story. And Sano said she enjoyed this. She said, quote, the flight of the Cheyennes is the epic story of the American Indian, one of the epics of our history. I hope that I've not failed my friends, both the Cheyennes and the whites, too greatly in my telling here. So when I, before I even get into what we're doing, I want to give an example of when we look at history, there can be two sides of it. So when teaching about the polarity and duality of history to my students, I always give this example, that of the history of the Dust Bowl, of the Great Plains. Now, I've taught Missouri, <clears throat> Nebraska, and Colorado, and usually they don't normally understand this example because they don't know what the Dust Bowl is. But I have a feeling that they have a few farmers, ranchers, or those acquainted with the history of land here today. Maybe. Some farmers are answered. And so my audience is right here today. <clears throat> so when we look at the Dust Bowl, an image of that there, <clears throat> some historians look at what happened is that we had hard scrabble individualists, rugged, hard working pioneers, Bernard Balin and Stephen Thornston, agree with this assertion and view these settlers as blameless. It's not their fault that the Dust Bowl happened, they were just trying to work the land, get the most out of the land they could. However, on the other side of the barbed wire fence, we have Donald Worcester. <clears throat> and his colleagues who blamed the settlers for the Dust Bowl. He says it was largely caused by ignorance, the greediness of the farmers, overplowing, overplanning, and the inevitable outcome of the culture that deliberately, quote, self consciously set itself that task of dominating and exploiting the land for all it was worth. Thus, we have awesome settlers on the one side, and then these awful settlers on the other side, who have seen that Dust Bowl. And so that's what I mean when we look at history, we might have been told one thing, but maybe we need more data in order to understand what the real truth of the history is. With the Dust Bowl, which is correct. 
correct to both be happening at the same time. We need all of the data to make sure we're actually presenting that correct part of history. So it is with these ideas in mind today that I'd like to talk to you about Mari Sandoz, someone who did not take the history of the event at face value, but wanted to try to get at yet another layer of the history of the event. I'll discuss <clears throat> Sandoz and who she was, her background, shine on in the craft of the story, the specific things Sandoz did in her work that were so remarkable, her activism, perception, and purpose. So with that, we get down into Ms. Sandoz, and all of these photos primarily are available via the National or the Nebraska Historical Society. But we have Sandoz right here and her dedication to her research topics, personality, candor, and work ethic. They allow her an intimate place amongst those she chose to write about. In the same way that Sanders was able to infiltrate the groups that she researched, they permeated her consciousness. You can see this from her diaries and her letters. Sanders was a Nebraska-born author and the daughter of Swiss immigrants who articulated life on the Great Plains of Nebraska with clear descriptions of the difficulties residents endured. She was an activist for those treated unjustly and used her position as an author to bring awareness to these issues in a factual, stark way. And that's primarily what my dissertation deals with. I looked at Sanders' letters as well as her books, and looked at commonalities that she had to argue for disempowered people, primarily women, farmers and laborers, and Native Americans throughout, um, which is what I talk about. So she utilized what's known as ethno-history, which is the idea of looking at a people and a culture over time, like the history of their events, in order to support her literary works of fiction and nonfiction. She did not just write about what interested her, she researched it relentlessly. That research was to some degree obsessive. Have you ever seen that show on hoarding? That's what her apartment looked like. She, when researching Fall of Heaven, for example, she moved to Denver and stayed on the ranch she was using, at, using it as her research point. For her crazy horse biography, she traveled to the Pine Ridge Reservation and lived on the reservation with the Lakota tribe, attempting to understand their ways, perspective, and understand their use of language. She had translators that she brought along and made transcriptions of those translations. And ultimately, Sandoz came to be almost like a granddaughter. Um, Crazy Horse's grandson, he dog, is quoted as saying that Mari Sandoz is like a granddaughter to me. And she also was able to, she discusses this moment, which is very special. She was staying at the tribe, and they were performing what's known as a ghost dance. And if you're familiar with the history of this, it's a very private, very special moment for the tribe. And they allowed Sandoz, this white woman, that's writing about this book about Crazy Horse to actually be a part of that event, which is quite significant um, when we look back at, at the significance of what that means for the, for the trial. So Sandoz would take notes about all this. Now, coming back to what I meant about hoarding, she'd stuff little notes in bags that she hung on the doorknob, and then her entire fireplace in New York was crammed full of notes. Her desks, and I have a photo here in a moment, also has these notes everywhere. She wrote all of this stuff down on note cards as she was researching this topic. Now again, keep in mind, she's writing fiction. A lot of fiction authors aren't going to spend the time to go do all this research about the event to the degree that she did, but she was trained when she attended University of Nebraska almost as an historian. So her advocacy for her group through her writing and personal effects shaped opinions in the Midwest and the U.S. Her writing style stood out in that she engaged in over-the-top research for her purpose of literary fiction. So it begs the question, why would an author Attempting to sell her work as fiction, research and interview for the stories to be sure they were so historically accurate with maddeningly obsessive detail. A visit to her archives demonstrates the over 45,000 note cards in her research files, which join clipping after newspaper clipping, written transcription of interviews, notes, photographs, postcards, her personal travels, maps that she drew out, calculations of weather patterns. All of these things that you will find in her books. For example, if she's talking about the, the cherry moon in a certain time of year, it is correct. If she talks about a plant it, that's blooming, it definitely would be blooming at that time in Kansas. You know, it's, she's very specific in the way she went about writing because she felt like if she would have said the wrong plant, um, <coughs> say Chris is reading the book, he's like, why is a rose blooming in Kansas in November? That doesn't make any sense. Then it kind of removes you from the history. But the way she tried to make sure every single detail was so on, it allows you as a reader to be able to envision that cactus bloom coming up or the way um, the ragweed comes and goes to my allergies to go crazy, right? Um, everything in there was very specific. So it's interesting, the detail. Her primary concern was not selling books, because that can kind of get a little expensive. <laughs> she actually said, um, I, please don't mind if you don't find my work saleable. I won't. You know, so she was writing these for 
purpose. She didn't really care about the money, which is, again, something interesting. So Sandra's background, her life on the plains, it was difficult to say the least. Those interested in the book, for starting, if you've never heard of Sandra's before, and you want to start somewhere, I always recommend Old Jewels, because it is a brutally honest portrayal about her youth and her adolescence, the abuse that she suffered at the hand of Jules, which is her father, um, growing up um, near Gordon. And you can actually go see the old homestead where she's buried is actually on that property. And you get to see her, uh, how was one word, her plucky and occasional insolent um, attitude toward her father as she uh, explains this life growing up on the plains. She was motivated to show her plans through the lens of the people when they lived there, and in doing so, she found herself serving as a representative for a disenfranchised group. Her activism is important, and the effect is that it changed some attitudes or brought some awareness and a more factually, historically based interpretation of the past, in both her fiction and her more non-fiction based short stories. Sanders' work is not a flight of fancy throwaway fiction novel. It is a carefully constructed political story that interviews narrative in order to draw readers into the issue, usually one of great significance. Despite the fact that her own experiences afforded a great amount of workable material for a text, Sanders expanded her writing vision beyond her personal tales of intrigue and focused most of her work on others and experience injustices in their lives. In fact, Sanders' Old Jewels is the rare text that does, in fact, deal with her family, telling the history of her father and the settling of the plains. Notably, Sanders' work does not be idealistic toward stories about the plains, as some more prominent Western authors do. She replicated the experience on the plains in a grittier and often more controversial way than other popular writers of her time. And as I was speaking with one of your board members earlier, that grittier way sometimes didn't put her on the favorite book list of the librarians. The Cook Library put her slogan house on, quote, Rotten Row, because of some of the things that she discussed there. Two her credit, I think being on a banned book list makes more people want to see what's happening in that banned book. But, read slow the rest of them, tell So, I have just a small collection of the work here. I think I must have started going back. There's a small collection of her work here. These are just some of the main ones. We have Old Jewels, Slow Mass, Capital City, Shine Autumn, Miss Marissa. Just a sampling of some of the books she, that she wrote. Slow House deals with the plains and this despotic fantastic mother figure that has, quote, a jelly mustache on her lip and chin hair. She's very interesting. Runs a brothel. There's a lot happening there. <laughs> Capital City um, is based in, quote, Franklin Kanawa, which is Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa. It's an allegorical city that is commenting on the political problems of that time. It's actually foreshadowing some of what's happening in World War II and reflecting on World War I, and also points out that there were, like, active Nazis in Lincoln at that time. And I think for a lot of people, they're like, this is happening in Nebraska at this time? This is interesting. Cheyenne Autumn, of course, we're familiar with. And Miss Marissa, uh, some of you in this region might find interesting. It's the tale of a frontier woman doctor. It's actually a hybridized truth between one uh, female doctor that's from over by northern Kansas, and the other one is from Nebraska. And it tells the story of a frontier doctor. But again, a lot of the history that she uses in there, the events that happened, were a compilation of these two, um, two doctors. So, in a way, her work clearly falls in line with a lot of other 20th century reformers, but she doesn't match the Gwilla Cather's plains, which are typically more saccharine and sweet. Uh, Sanders is kind of known for her grittier work, as I said earlier, in a letter that she wrote to her editor. Sincerely, and don't mind if you won't find my work saleable, because I won't. She wrote about what she believed rather than what she thought was more popular or successful. But, why have scholars not realized the importance that Sanders has? Conceivably, they aren't considering the context in which she was writing, the fact that it was a female author in Nebraska, where that, again, was very atypical, and also the forces that she was up against in her writing. Sanders' letter and archival papers provide detailed explanation of Sanders' writing methodology and her advocacy strategy, which centered primarily upon traveling, writing, and speaking, she traveled extensively through the Great Plains, Southwest, and Rocky Mountains in order to become more familiar with the areas she was writing about. She viewed her work as a historical project. She wanted to tell the history of the people, not necessarily examine them from the outsider's perspective or as a sociologist or anthropologist. This is difficult because as an outsider, there is a racial order that exists. How could this white woman from Florida, Nebraska be able to write a biography of Crazy Horse from the Lakota perspective. She was aware of that, and that's why she did all this research, why she wanted to get the tales from the old timers, because she thought of herself as a voice. Whereas in the 1950s, a Native American 
African-American had a lot less chance of getting published, she knew she had a voice, and she could tell that story as best she could for the people that otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. So now we turn to Shine and Mikata, and Sandoz's advocacy for Native Americans. When we consider this author, and if you see photos of her, she's about 5'1", five, 5'2", five, very, very tiny, I think soaking wet, maybe 105 pounds, and some of the re research I found. She had this tender, weedy look, but it belied a simmering countenance. She took on Native American injustice like an angry calf escaping that clove hitch at the rodeo. Sandoz's activism, and thank you for getting that because most people don't. Sandoz's activism on behalf of Native Americans and Native American rights was bountiful, it was passionate. In her numerous letters to government bodies, that including Harry S. Truman, she wrote several letters to him, it is evident she viewed Native Americans as neighbors and as family. Misrepresentation in other texts in Hollywood film adaptations disenchanted and infuriated Sandoz, particularly the working of her own Shia Autumn for driver John Ford. We'll come to discuss this here in a moment, but I will just say she was angry about how Ford had changed Cheyenne Autumn and afterwards never wanted to work with movie people again. She took issue with the credibility also of uh, Howard Fast, who was writing about the same time, his manuscript on the Cheyenne. Other films, like Ford's The Searchers, which I believe a lot of us in here may have seen, embody the stereotypes she fought so hard against. Her frustration stemmed from both historical inaccuracies and blatant intolerance and ignorance of tribal history. She states, why does everyone put Unsuian headbands on the girls? Or because she would say, okay, it's the Sioux people, but they would be dressed in what you people would be wearing. So she, she would, it made her so mad that people were so indiscriminate. And Cheyenne Ott and all the actors that were cast were from Mexico, they weren't Native American actors, and again, these types of things really frustrated her. She hated how they would reference lazy box, propagating the notion that, that Native Americans were hard workers, because they very clearly were. So she took issue with the way that Native Americans were presented and the way erroneous judgments were being made. As Wine Deloria states in his introduction to Sandoz's edition of Crazy Horse, quote, Sandoz's accounts of the Indians during the 1850s through the 70s <clears throat> surpasses other such works in terms of its accuracy and its clarity. She paints a clear picture of events in the Northern Plains in contrast with other historians. Native Americans were triply disempowered by the colonists, by perhaps lack of language mastery, as well as the government's limitations. Sando sought to shed light upon these issues and unbind the Native American representation from its shackles. So let's consider now the specifics of what Sandoz did with this text. After another author threatened to preempt Sandoz's work on the Cheyenne, her friend, who she traveled with a lot, Eleanor Hinman, again suggested Sandoz take on the material because Hinman believed that she had spent so much time with the Cheyenne she had a story to tell. She spent another three years of research on the Cyan Project, spent four months in Washington, and a letter to J.D. Weimer of Stratton, Nebraska wrote that she had, quote, uncovered much material that has not been available to anyone on the part of Cheyenne difficulties. And she surpassed over 30,000 note cards when writing. She discussed the difficulty in uncovering the Sabbath Creek incident, stating, quote, it needs clearing up. Researching for decades, Sandoz spent time around Cheyenne survivors and interviewed Northern Cheyenne. This took time as it was, quote, contrary to Native American custom, to talk to those who have died, talk about those who have died, perhaps also because they still feared reprisals from the Sapa killings. So she asked questions, and she asked again. And last night, Charlene asked me a little bit about some of the research that she did for Cheyenne Autumn. She relied a lot on historical accounts, but she also was doing interviews with some family members of settlers that had been in the region, and you can find that in the works cited of Cheyenne Autumn. So she wrote Cheyenne Autumn, actually from the East, which was sort of atypical. What she usually wrote about the Midwest, she stayed in Lincoln, or she stayed at, um, in the Pine Ridge Reservation. But the reason she wanted to write from her Greenwich apartment, New York City apartment, was because she had access to the New York City Public Library, Archives of the East, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Archives, and the Yale Coe Collection. And the Coe, that COE collection, houses a repository of a lot of Western um, Western uh, stories, and so it was one of the preeminent collections, and it still is if you're uh, researching in that area. <clears throat> there was also a ledger from Little Fingernail, that is his name, body that was saved at the American Museum of Natural History. She thought it would be easier for her to stay in New York than to move all her papers back to Lincoln, and all of her research material, again, as I said, filled her New York apartment, workroom, closets, even the kitchen table, chairs, table, on all the only spot not covered with boxes and files was the kitchen sink. She didn't cook a lot, so but she's going to have back down, so maybe that explains it. Uh, the wizard even reported files in the fireplace. In addition to her research in 
the archives, she relied on the knowledge she had retained from wandering the grounds of the Niagara River Valley. She drew maps. She returned to experience the land physically in Kansas and through Nebraska, visiting with, again, that H.D. Doc Weimer from the Nebraska State Historical Society. Weimer was able to help her investigate these two related massacres in this region on the Saco River. And so I believe that his help, um, you'll see a lot of letters from him in her archives, was very helpful. In crafting the story, Sam has had to explain what happened. So this is her account, which I know may be different from what you all have heard before. But remember, we have to think about, to get at the truth of the history, we've got to maybe look at a bunch of different sources. So I just hope that you can hear this with a listening ear and see uh, what Sandoz had to say. She talks about 240, 284 sick and half-starved Cheyenne are returning to their former homes from Oklahoma, which they had been sent to. So they were right from Yellowstone, all right, going to this Oklahoma reservation in 1877. But there were a lot of people dying from malaria. They were sick. They weren't getting fed adequately. And so they abandoned that camp and drove north, saving off hunger and danger. Eventually, they split. So we have Little Wolf and we have Dole Knight. And the group of stronger members with Little Wolf went for a more direct route to Yellowstone and were captured uh, the following spring. The, the larger group, mostly sick, wounded women and children, uh, with horses exhausted, sought safety in the Nebraska Sandhills. They were discovered and sent to Fort Robinson and ultimately did sort of a death march after they were captured. Uh, the soldiers said, we're only going to feed you once you get to Fort Robinson. It was snowing and it was awful conditions, but they marched them up to Fort Robinson. So they were denied food, <clears throat> they were denied water, they were denied basic necessities, extended to human lives, and they fought for their lives until ultimate extermination. The Cheyenne on the plotline <clears throat> tells the story of the Northern Cheyenne people from their side. We get to see more of the battle numbers. We get to see how the Cheyennes were affected physically, mentally, and emotionally. For example, we learn about mental illness, how sickness was growing inside black coyote, she discusses. It shows the Cheyennes how, quote, some stumbling a little in weakness or from contagion and anxiety. The journey was difficult physically and emotionally. And in Santos' research in 1875, quote, the Cheyenne keeper of the sacred arrow was medicine arrow, also known as stone forehead, and the chief bad heart and their village were killed by soldiers and buffalo hunters, and that was in 1875. But in 1878 came the retaliation, the killing of 19 white settlers by Cheyenne under Dole Knife and Little Wolf as they passed through this area on the north. So that comes back to what Richard Little Bear was saying, is that we need to have a balanced view. What was the precipitating events that maybe caused or what was later happening? The chapters that are most relevant to our area now in Cheyenne Autumn, if we're interested, are I mean, kind of the amps up around chapters five and six, but chapters seven and eight, Sapa meaning black and to make the bat heart good chapters. And Sanderson's version pays more attention to what generated the cause of the 19th settlers' demise rather than just focusing on, again, a horrible, horrible incident. Please don't misunderstand. What your community went through at that time is tragic, but we also have to think that it didn't just happened in a vacuum. There were other events that were happening around it at that time. She complicates what was happening for the Cheyenne during the battle. We learned about how women acted. Uh, the Cheyenne had a lot more gender equality. A lot of their women were fighting um, on, on the front lines. And it shows the difficulty that younger Cheyenne were already beginning to have. The ones that were agency raised had never hunted buffalo. They'd never been on a raid. And so you can see how Dole Life deals with some of these young warriors that are going against what he says. There's a poignant moment, I think, in chapter 8, where he talks about these six young bucks that end up going off and capturing women. And he's like, that's against what we do. We keep women and children safe. We don't go abduct women. But six of them kind of just went off script and kind of started doing their own thing. So we see Santos discussing some of those battles and issues and even within the Cheyenne tribe they were having. With Santos, the Cheyenne truth comes forth. Each side perhaps views the situation differently. The whites feel that the Cheyennes are following orders and rebelling, and the Cheyennes just want to be free to live where they were promised and assured by the government they one day could. The Cheyennes were removed to Oklahoma through a forced march, many died en route. And some Cheyenne ultimately adapted to life in Oklahoma, but others, specifically the Northern Cheyenne, did not. And that's why Dole Knight and Little Wolf wanted to go back to the Yellowstone homeland. Here we see that. Two men standing up with their families and friends, deciding, despite lack of strength, being wounded, um, not being equipped for what he needed, to make that decision to go. I was interested last night, I want to know how far it was from Scott City to here in three days. How do you make that journey? If you were wounded, you didn't have horses, just imagine that. And that second group that was ultimately covered by more wounded women and children led by Dole Knight, Captured, being taken to Fort Rob, marching through the snow, desperate, struggling, starving. 
You still have not reached your home, but yet you've been driven like cattle to yet another reservation to see a um, sitting bull, someone that you perhaps honored and, and really respected, caught in the iron chains, he discusses. So the shining desperation won out when they ultimately got to that reservation, and Dolanite and his followers escaped. 30 were shot, 50 were reunited with the Northern Cheyenne in Southeast Montana, and today the Cheyenne have two primary reservations in Town River, Montana, and Southwestern Oklahoma, <clears throat> shared with their allies in Rock and This is a sad story. It is more than just this one incident. Although if you were here locally or were a family member of a settler who passed this incident, speaks very personally to you. And I want to respect and honor that loss. Some of you in here may have had an ancestor killed in this incident, and I am sorry for your family's loss. However, in the scope of things, this was more than just this one battle. It was the consistent, systemized nature of disempowerment and murder that pushed the shine to this point. So that's again what I meant about earlier, how we need to look at all sides of the story. If we can get too close to something, it makes it difficult to see. And I'm reminded of Mama Pune's water lily painting. Um, I had the chance to see this in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins Museum. And if you ever look really close at it, that's the top picture of the air in the far. My young people will know the elbow reference of the air in the far. It looks just like blobs, it's lovely. Modern art, not kidding, right? But if you stand far away, you can begin to see, okay, it's, we got a beautiful pond, we have water lilies, so it looks totally different. And in a way, for that, me, that, that image really resonates when I think about history. If you only look at the one event, Makes it really hard to understand what's happening, but if we step back and look at that whole Monet water lily really painting, we can begin to see what was happening in the 1800s, not just what happened at this one moment in time. So that's what I really want to encourage all of you budding historians out there, or remaining historians, to do. Sanders was concerned with the accuracy of history and was incredulous at the amount of misinformation disseminated about Native peoples and the tribes she knew and worked with so well. She wrote, quote, oh, truly legendary material is important historically, sociologically, and artificially tinctured with the white man's stories read or heard, it is nothing, as you know. Here, Sanders indicates how this important information about Native Americans, which is truly legendary, as she claims, needs reporting. Yet reporting just another iteration of someone else's tall tales will do nothing to advance cultures or understanding of these peoples, and Sanders knew that she must correct this and tell the most corrected version of that history. She indicates her goal and strategy in Cheyenne Autumn. Not only is she telling the story of the Cheyenne, but providing the historical context, and besides that, it is more than just one battle that the Cheyenne were involved with. It represents all of the injustices the Cheyenne had endured up to that point in history, and foreshadowed what happened between that event and when Sandoz actually wrote it later in 59. It is no coincidence that John Ford chose to tell his stories of Native American intrigue, why Dances with Wolves and The Last of the Mohicans were some of the most popular movies of the times. The Native American people are and were awe-inspiring. But these texts are not often based upon historical data. They do serve to bring awareness to some Native American peoples and issues, but it changes society in interesting ways. And as researchers Robert Hine and John Matt Farragher argue, quote, Indians playing the good guys are what were atypical to be seen in a lot of these films. And this opened up with Ross Baker and other demographers called the Dances with Wolf Syndrome. It has become sort of neat to be an Indian, he says. <coughs> Hyde and Farragher argue that the film caused more people to self-identify as Native Americans. And so the romanticized notion of Native Americans in this work, perhaps, although not entirely accurate, not really accurate at all, served to bring about awareness to Native American peoples. Thus, they achieve what Native American activist Russell Means says, quote, we're still here, we're still resisting, John Wayne did not kill us all. <laughs> the publicity of the Native American people is both positive and negative, and increased awareness about the Native American struggle and encouraged Native Americans to self-identify more readily. The Native American experience honestly was a preoccupation for Sandoz. It, you know, she starts publishing a lot more about that in the late 40s, early 50s, through the 60s, but that was all she really was focusing on. Earlier on in her life, she was speaking more about capitalism and female empowerment, these types of things. But later on, it really became a primary focus for her. She felt that, quote, <clears throat> American Indian history was essential to the study of American history. So the main difference that Sandoz employed in her progression of history was concrete historical research. I want to talk to you a little bit about her research strategy and where you can also locate her archives. She was practicing what's known as revisionist history already in the 1940s. And you were with us last night, 
that you heard about what revisionist history was, but I'm going to cover that again. So when we look at early history, it's mostly what is happening with those in power, which primarily, earlier on, is white males. So let's just take an event such as Civil War. A lot of early history that was being published from the 1900s to 1950s tells me what battles were being fought, who was fighting them, what was the military doing. Now, if you look at like history over time, you begin to see in the like 1950s, more in the 60s and 70s, people say, what were women doing in the Civil War? So then, historians, revisionist historians, start to talk to us about, well, women were doing this, they were helping out, um, they were giving up things in the kitchen, this is what they were doing in order to help the men on the battlefield. <clears throat> so we got men and women, white men and women. But then in the 70s and 80s, people said, hi, I wonder what Native Americans were doing in the Civil War. So then we start to see, oh, this is how that impacted them. And so when you look at history books, again, you, you start to notice that there was kind of an evolution in whose voices actually got to be shared. What's so significant, again, about Santos is revisionist historians, like even Patty Lemberg, one of our uh, Colorado uh, state historians, she just finished out her Robert State Historian. Um, Patty Lemberg was a big revisionist historian. She didn't really start writing until the 80s. So we have Sandoz doing revisionist history in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, which is pretty cool. Uh, she's so sparky, I think, again, when you read her archives, it gets really interesting to see this woman that was going out and doing these types of things. But the thing about Sandoz, though, she did all this research, but if you look at Shia Mata, there is rare narrative footnoting. Now, this is one of my students writing paper, they would get an F just for citation, because if you say <laughs> you got this information from somewhere, you have to cite where you got credit from. I need some F, you've got to cite where you get credit from. But she doesn't cite it, and so it's like a fiction book. Like you read a Danielle Steele novel, right? So that's a problem that historians take with this. Because if you're a historian, you know you have to cite your material. Otherwise, number one, it's plagiarism. But number two, it doesn't give you the credibility for your argument. So when Sandoz deliberately chose not to do that, she's alienating historians. On the other hand, if you were someone just picking this up as like a general reader, sometimes when you see all those citations, it becomes more complicated. It seems like a harder text. And so I think Sandoz left out some of those citations because she just wanted people to read the story, not get mired down in where it came from. She was trying to tell again the history of the event, but she didn't really bother with the citation. Although, again, if you look at the work cited, or you go down to her archives at the Love Library at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, or the archive that's held at Shadow State College with her detail, you can see, again, she researched everything. So the problem, I think, with Sandoz at the time that her work came out is she, in a way, she was so detailed on her research, it kind of alienated the fiction writers, like, all right, stop giving me so much detail about the moon rising, it's really long, I want to skip this. And then the historians are getting great history detail, but where is your citation? So it's kind of an interesting thing about Sandoz that I think historians have wrestled with uh, for some time. Well, what's interesting is at the time, while well, there was that discrepancy, now, Sandoz is known for her work. In fact, known for the ability that she had. If you look at Crazy Horses genealogy, it is very confusing, very hard to map out. But other people still today, if you look at Dee Brown, you look at um, Thomas Powers' work on Crazy Horse, all of them are citing Sandoz, even though Sandoz didn't cite very much, which again is atypical. If I was going to write a paper for a history conference, I would usually cite random JoeSmithsBlogspot.com because they say you don't have any credibility, you're not citing someone. But people have begun to see Sandoz as someone that is credible. And so you, I always, whenever I see a new book out that I know Sandoz research, I put to the back, I see, okay, Sandoz and that usually is. Which is kind of good. So, <clears throat> Sandoz gave, what had a unique position as a researcher. Um, when she was a child on the high plains, she heard the story of the Cheyenne flight, and she wanted to interview her survivors. She, again, dug into official reports and contemporary documents her book, as Ed Prescott, book reviewer for the New York Times, wrote, it is as authentic as it is possible to make it. So one of the ways that Sandoz <clears throat> attempted to give the more appropriate story was revising language. So if you read Cheyenne, it's from the Native American perspective, but it also utilizes language uh, that the Cheyenne people would use. She noted the difficulty in writing about the tribe and discussed how she had to really be with the people or to learn the idioms and the way that they would phrase something or if it was a word that they would have used. And in one quote, she says, I hope I still get a little bit of the feeling into the story because she's so worried about am I using the right term or not? Um, is it appropriate? <coughs> so, Sierra's knew that there was a lot of inconsistency already. She wanted to make sure that language was accurate. 
She was trying to, to divest of the other in space. If she would have just written about, yeah, the city bulls and handcuffs. Well, that's not the term that the Native Americans would have used. They would have said he was in iron cuffs. But if, she would have said he was in handcuffs, and people would say, well, I don't know about the sandals. She's not really being accurate entirely. So she really worked to divest herself of the other in space between her as a white woman writing about Native American tribes. This is an ambitious goal because Sanders ran the risk, ran the risk of alienating her audience and her sources, who she greatly respected. What if she got wrong? Instead of iron cuffs, she called it iron bracelets. That was offensive. You know, she really had to do a lot of research to make sure she was not being offensive, and in order to get her works to ring true. As Vine Gloria also states, quote, Sanders had presented a masterful and wholly authentic account of the struggle for the Northern Plains during the 1850s to 1870s. It almost switched every line, ring true. Sanders was very specific to her publishers and copy editors that they follow her specific words and language to echo that the Cheyenne. But a lot of her editors <clears throat> absolutely hated that. Um, they would want her to change language, and she was very difficult to work with. Um, in her archives are copies, carbon copies of all of her letters, and so you can read her correspondence with her with her editors. And for those of you that are young, yeah, I guess we actually have a few here today, typewriters. Okay, before computers, this thing in Taiwan, we're going right? So Taiwan, there used to be copies, like when you would put the paper through a carbon copy of the letter that you wrote. So she'd mail one letter, she'd save the other one. So we have almost all of Sanders' letter correspondence. Again, order, but she saved it. And so we have that, and she did save several letters that she received from people as well. So we see her letters back and forth to her editor. I cannot imagine that. Now, now I'm just going to be happy to have the publishers, so if they want to make edits, great, I'm happy with it. But she would be like, no, you're changing it. Language I would use, she was very difficult to work with. And so we see, when we read Sanders, a lot of the reviews say, quote, in historical craftsmanship, one expects the best from Miss Sanders. And in this volume, you will not be disappointed. If there is a criticism, it is a strange one that the book is too well written. The reader, or at least this one, sometimes loses the historical narrative in a brilliant sweep of the literary style. Miss Sanders, as usual, comes up with superb imagery. As, for example, his whispers, his moccasins being a whisper on the dry buffalo grass, or someone being as angry as a gut shot panther. Doesn't that just for the show how angry he was, right? But clearly, in evaluating Sanders' technique, some of the reviewers say the language is, is a, like a stilted dialogue to a B movie, like really a bad Western movie. And it, it almost and sometimes was a little bit ignorant and encouraged some stereotypical. Ocean. So what I'm trying to say is I'm not just standing up here saying Sanders was awesome. She was really doing important work, but sometimes there are places where she misses the mark. And especially if you are familiar with the Cheyenne culture, you might say, ah, something's not quite right here. She was doing the best she could, I think, at that time. And I want to be very clear that I would say probably about 90% of the reviewers really liked what she was doing, but 10%, I think, found some issue and took, took problems with it. Sanders is clear caring for her sources displays that she was not trying to poke fun or indicate ignorance with her character's word choices. Rather, she was demonstrating how concepts could be unfamiliar to Native Americans. And at times, she didn't get the language quite right using terms or phrases that folks would have used. But she really attempted to be very specific. In, in talking about her, her relationship with her editor, there was a moment where she dealt with one editor, and she complained to Ed Aswell, her publisher, said, I'm not going to work with him again. He's awful. I can't deal with him. And Ed Aswell, <clears throat> oddly enough, he wouldn't normally do this with the writers. He said, stick with your editors. What you have to do. He wrote back saying, I must have assigned, quote, the most thoroughly limited, thoroughly limited Easterner of my whole staff. He pulled up, got Sanders with another editor, and proved, he said, quote, every decision on language choices she gets to keep. That's how much this publisher trusts her, which, again, is atypical for the time. You'd be editing that work author and, and telling them how to change things. But Aswell trusted that she knew the information well enough to get to, to be able to keep that language. To his credit, though, that poor Easter copy editor may have had a point. He worried that the language might serve as a factor to alienate readers who are already alienated in a sense that they were reading Sanders' translation of a situation. And some critics uh, that I found from the New York Times would say that it is really difficult to think like an Indian, but even more difficult, it is difficult to think like the Sanders' version of an Indian. That same critic noted that in spite of his many imperfections, it still was in many ways a remarkable book. Thus, <clears throat> although her method made out of a 
fully understood, her larger concept, that of the plight of the Native Americans, was clear. She strove to educate about the ramifications of Native American mistreatment, how this mistreatment was more than just a loss of land and territory, but affected cultural, emotional, and psychological aspects of the Native peoples of the United States. As another more recent reviewer notes about Sandoz's work, pursuant to Crazy Horse, Sandoz displayed an exquisite sensitivity to the spiritual and cultural impact of the language and the topography, and intensely conveyed the emotional, psychological, and religious universe of the Plains Indians. Thus, even a failed effort of Sandoz, I believe, does some work, because it advanced knowledge at that time about the multifaceted way in which Native Americans were affected. She's staking a claim in the importance of the accuracy of representation, as well as the impact that education can have on social change and social justice. As Oliver Lafarge wrote, quote, Mari Sanders has gone inside the Cheyennes. Ultimately, Sanders' drive here derives from her desire to revise history. And this was not an easy task, because his friend Charles Barrett wrote, quote, I can well understand what a historian is up against in his search for the truth. It must be very difficult to sift the facts from the truth. Sanders tried to do the sifting, and that credibility was later recognized by the tribe she wrote about. Her Native American works and letters display her concern for racism in the United States. She tracked problems of racism in the U.S. to Congress and other elected officials. She wrote off into the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And in letters to Mr. James R. Webb, she criticized uh, the way that he represented Native Americans in the film. She wrote to him, quote, and this was his reinterpretation of her Cheyenne. He was the screenwriter for Cheyenne Autumn. She said, quote, your concoction and that's in the green box there. Your concoction of the Cheyenne script is something entirely different. Has it ever occurred to you that you would have never dared to take such liberties with the great men of any other minority, only with the American Indian? Perhaps this will prove the last time for such libel. I hope so. In the meantime, your face must burn with shame. She did not. Again, she's really smart. She did not of Native American was recognized or understood. Her drive to eliminate racism really derives from her opinion that Native Americans have been unjustly treated. She saw that growing up near, near where she's at in Gordon, saw how the Pine Ridge uh, Native American tribe, the Lakota, or well, Lakota were treated, and she really felt that they were not able to speak for themselves. So it is important that when Sanos writes, you'll know she's not lecturing her readers. She doesn't dictate how you can think here. She just presents the facts and let you arrive at your own conclusion. So she's not saying, dear reader, make sure that you think about what happened in Scott City before it happened in Sabbath Creek. She says, this is what happened. And then we go here, and then she tells about what happened on the way to Fort Robinson. It's not, she doesn't directly tell you the way that you need to respond to the, to the action. And that's important as a historian. We're not supposed to give our own personal viewpoint. We're supposed to just give the facts and let you decide what you need to do with them. So again, it's really remarkable what Sandoz, this, you know, former teacher on the plains that ended up, she, this is an interesting story, she got to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, she wasn't technically supposed to get in because she didn't have a high school degree, she had a sixth grade education, and she ended up going up to the front desk and kept going back every day, saying, will you let me in, will you let me in, and they let every, like, persistence pays off, because finally, I think it was after two months of going by every day, the guy <clears throat> that was the dean of the college at the time, let's say this, like, come in, fine, take a meeting. And he asked her what she was going to do at school, and she explained she wanted to study history, and she was a writer, she wanted to work on that. And he said, well, what's the worst she could do, fail? And so he let her in. And it was from that moment when she got to work with Fink and other historians at University of Nebraska Lincoln that she really refined her historical method. And that's also when she got an internship at the National or the Nebraska State Historical Society. And that's when they would her historian work sort of kicked off. Again, this would have been in the 30s. Prior to that, she did write some little short stories when she was a, a school teacher. But all of that additional historian uh, work really derived out of her education and that she received at the University of Nebraska. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about reception before we end up in how we read Sandoz. Sandoz corrected or encouraged scholars, academics, and writers that sought her expertise. Many wrote asking questions to her about Native American genealogy and the archives of all these letters about people saying, hey, I want to know, can you tell me about this historical event? Or Kyle may say, hey, I'm New Oberlin, will you tell me about what happened in Oberlin at this time period? And she'd say, those would fire off a letter back to her. And then Andrea might write, say, hey, I'm related to so-and-so, can you tell me about it? And Sandoz would 
quickly articulate. While she's publishing prolific books, you look at that bookmark, see how many books she's publishing. Busy lady, but she was still taking the time to write back and make sure that people knew their history. And many wrote to her in order just to understand a particular custom or tradition. What's the ghost dance? How does that work? Later authors do not deny that her source material and aspects of her work are the best records of some aspects of the American material. And her first research, again, is so well done that readers, uh, writers often cite Sanders. And Helen Winter Stafford, who was kind of the first person to write a book about Sanders in the 80s, it's a biography of, of Mari Sanders. If you're interested in it, there's actually two books that Stafford wrote. One is Mari Sanders' Storyteller of the Plains, the other one is just Collected Letters of Mari Sanders. So some of those letters I'm talking about in the archives are published all in one book. And so Stan, when Stafford wrote about her, she said, quote, sometimes Sanders' material, great squashes of, the, of it, are often embedded, unacknowledged in someone else's book. Which kind of stopped her to the task. People are citing Sandoz and not quoting her, and I do that too. Now I'm like, oh, they didn't cite that Sandoz did this research. It's so cool. The detail and information Sandoz obtained in her interviews through her habitation with the tribal communities often allowed her some of the best information that's still used today. As Sandoz tried to correct history, she worked against the portrayal of Cheyenne as savage killers, not as, quote, destitute and on the brink of starvation. Sandoz thought a horrible injustice had been done to Crazy Horse, Lakota, and Dole Knife, and Cheyenne, and wanted to share that narrative rather than that angry, savage, resisting arrest narrative, which received a more popular telling, specifically in movies and texts at that time. Sandoz did not approach this task with hefty, without hefty consideration. She knew she had to stand behind her work, that she diligently researched and cross checked her material. Her archival material shows notes, it shows her asking these questions to one uh, Native American man and then repeating the same question to someone else just to make sure that data was correct. She performed extensive work to this interviews to ascertain beliefs and rituals. And she didn't just rely on general knowledge about these people. She went directly to the source she was writing about an inquired interview to know to know anything. She didn't rely on that stereotypical representation from other texts, despite the apparent popularity. Alan Boy, in his introduction to Cheyenne Autumn, which is included in this specific edition, if you happen to have it, Alan Boy writes, quote, it stands as the most informed account of that dark time. She approached the writing of her Native American text with an anthropologist and an ethnographer's eyes and her description of tradition and actions, historians' precision for detail and confirmation in her descriptions of the tribe's history and environment. Cheyenne Otto specifically has an interesting reception. Soffer argues that it received more critical acclaim than Crazy Horse, which is sort of interesting since Crazy Horse you would expect to be more popular since it was through like, a story through the lens of Crazy Horse himself. Critic Edgar Stewart argues in a New York Times book review, Maurice Sanders has taken an obscure and relatively little known event in American history and giving it sweep and dignity of an epic and historical craftsmanship one expects the best from Miss Sanders. And in this volume, he will not be disappointed. Of it is equal to anything she's ever written. To say more, to attempt to summarize the book would be to spoil, spoil the whole story for the reader, and this is a volume which should be read and savored every morsel will tantalizingly under the tongue by every real lover of the American West. Thus, this book truly became viewed as a success. And in reading this, this book, I've probably read it like 15 or 20 times, and even reading it this last time, and this last week I kept going over chapter 7 and 8, I keep catching more things. So I just love that image of rolling a piece of it tantalizingly under the tongue, because there's so much history, there's so many facts, that when we go back and maybe review the chapter, this, this is not a book you're going to read the beach in an hour and a half. You know? It's going to take a little bit of time to really understand well, who's what, where they're going, and how does this connect. Um, so take your time with Sanos, and it ultimately you feel like you'll appreciate that work. But that kind of leads to my next There is difficulty in reading Sanos, right? Now, right? right. Who's your read Sanos? Us hours. Anybody read Sanos books? Now, I know some of you did your tour. Now, those of you that read Sanos, who found our relief book? And then I was going to ask who's lying, but at least no one raised your hand. Now, those of you that are readers, like, great, there's this lady talking for an hour about a reader that, that a writer that's hard to read. I'm not saying that she's someone you should totally dismiss, but I'm saying that when you go in to read one of her books, it's helpful if you have a mindset in the back of your mind. Because, uh, and I'll just give you an example. My dissertation advisor, if you go for a doctorate, you have to write a dissertation, and you normally have to go before a board of five or six faculty members who quiz you like you're on a firing squad. And one of my main guys, that was my head, told me 
when I first started this, this is not a good sign. Normally for a dissertation, she said, that crazy horse is such a slog. I'm like, I hope you like it, but it's going to be defended. But it, to his credit, it is. It's hard to read it. There's so much dense history. He read Capital City, he liked that better. But then he returned back to Crazy Horse, and he said, now that I know where I'm going with it, now that I know what she was trying to do, how she was trying to be more of a historian, I like it a lot better. So he wasn't trying to compare, like, her work with Lilith, let's say, Sandoz with, like, Janet Ivanovich, a mystery novel, you just read the next page, you want to know what's coming next. He's like, but I read it like it's a history text. I like it a lot better. So if you were new to Sandoz, you have to start off with old jewels, so you understand who she is and what she did. But when you get to Shyamalan, you take your time with it, really try to understand, okay, where were they at? Look at a map. All right, how far is Scott City from, from the South? Where's Fort Robinson at? Well, where's Cheyenne Hole at? I know that a lot of you here may actually have someone here who has some ground here where these events happen. Go on the ground, take a look at it, and see if you can't recognize some of what's happening. Because it will allow you to really understand more of what Sandoz is trying to do. So, some people find a lot of significance in Sandoz's work, and a lot may dismiss it and struggle with it more. And the thing I think is, if you're coming to it to try to find a lighthearted, unserious read about the plane, you're going to be disappointed. Because it's not, I feel like I can read Catherine a lot quicker than I can with Sandoz. While a casual reader doesn't really care about this, if you're a historian, you really appreciate the fact that she has the moving sequence right and the right flowers. So her vision of history would dare mention an out of season flower or non native tree. Her research files show that she detailed what plant would bloom, when, and where, and how each Native American tribe would use them differently. A casual reader might not care. <clears throat> but the historian, or a Christian oriented reader, finds these details important because they hide your credibility. We trust her then. If she, again, would have had, a, like, we'll say, a tree that's popular in the South in your book that talks about Kansas, then I would trust her. But she gets the details right. Further complicating reading Sandoz is that some of the maps, Sandoz and Oakville include with this, aren't in them. On the first published occasion, she had all of these detailed maps that they didn't go out. And if you're reading this, even chapter 7 and 8, she bounces between 1875 and 1878, bounces between different locations, and it's kind of hard, even for me, and I know where she's going, it's no surprise what is next. And I'm like, where, who's she talking about now? What, what chapter are we on? So it's important that you really take your time with, with Sandoz. All of these aspects <clears throat> combined complicated the reader's understanding of this very difficult to follow story. Now again, the historian probably should take issue with Sandoz, and I kind of just wanted to explain some of those issues. She didn't have citations, it was a dense read, a lot of details. Whereas what counted the criticism is that she would have cited things or explained why she was using this dense history. Now, if Sandoz would have wanted to do something different, she probably would have taken this critique and said, absolutely not. I don't make any changes. Because Sandoz had a real purpose for what she was going to do. Sandoz wrote, quote, I hear Eastern rumblings of disapproval of some of my version of American history. I should hope so. I mean, like, that's what she wanted. I should hope so. Thus, Sandoz was interested in revising history, not only in order to make it a compelling story for the readers, but also to share history. Yet, as many historians and readers are sure to have critiqued, the problem with this type of writing is the difficulty to assess what is true and what's not. Quote, well, once the writer admits that some of what she's written is fiction, the reader feels a justified sense of betrayal and is bound to suspend judgment. So, for example, Miss Marissa, I know going into it that it's two frontier doctors, it's not one person, it's not the truth, right? But she does pretty much tell the story of one lady and another lady who created it into one. But even though I know that, I kind of don't want to trust some of the other things that she said. So that's another troublesome aspect of reading Sandoz. Is I'm never quite sure, depending on what's like one of the archives I learned, but is this part true? Is it not? How does this work? So it seems academic historians have been a little bit more quick to dismiss Sandoz's contribution without a moment's consideration. But I believe it's time to reevaluate Sandoz's work, and that's why I basically spent the last 12 years of my life with her, is that I want to see the way this strong willed slightly obsessive, mildly paranoid woman in Nebraska, a little bit left leaning, was able to rise as a progressive reformer and influential woman in Nebraska. I believe it's time to give Mari Sandoz her due by looking at the evidence from the woman herself and evaluate it with a critical eye. So I'd like to just discuss a little bit about her purpose and force before we close. Sandoz saw her ability as a writer endowed with responsibility to enlighten. Readers see in her passion for uh, farmers and laborers with her anti-capitalist works, her work with women, and especially in the case of Native American injustices, were blatant 
discriminations were clear in the upper echelons of government and power. Santos discusses injustice, lack of legal counsel, abuse of oil and cattle rights, and reflects on the Native Americans' treatment, the loss of the buffalo. Santos wrote prolifically about the Native Americans that she had known from her childhood. As Helen Winter Stocker asserts, Mari hoped to draw attention to the current problems of the Indians. There were some issues, though. As Kimberly Lee argues, despite her campaign against negative stereotyping, Santos' time was given to a certain amount of stereotyping of her own. She sometimes overemphasized Indians as victims of devastating circumstances. It seems apparent that in an effort to gain a sympathetic audience, Santos sometimes crossed the line into sentimentalism and romanticism. Santos walked that fine line promoting awareness and slipping into overstepping cultural boundaries and acceptable notions of representation in her work. When she wrote to congressional officials as an activist for the Cheyenne, she conceptualized the way in which the situation could be rectified. This is not just a problem-oriented letter, but also a solution-oriented letter. Santos does not cast blame. She just says that the government is responsible for helping them perceive some of the lot of the outlay of the out. Without that income, Samuels points out the few opportunities the Cheyenne had for work. She points out sadly, quote, it is not good to see these people on relief, descendants of a tribe that produced some of the greatest warriors of the plains. They're women amongst the finest bill, bill and bead workers. Women considered by both, both whites and Indians as the most virtuous of any people on the continent. Santos appears to be playing to Truman's and other politicians' sympathies to those who want to work but are unable to. Some of Santos' purpose was to share the real history as it happened. But the fact remains, how are we or readers to know what is factual or not? While it is commendable that Santos is attempting to share the data story with the public, her embellishments, which really are a flattering way of saying fiction, could serve to alienate readers or, at best, confuse them. However, Santos would not look at this as falsification. Now, I'm going to show us a quick clip here. And Santos so would look at this as falsification. This is fun to go off the isn't it? I'm going to blow this up. This is a, a clip, and it's available on YouTube. If you want to see Santos, this is her right there. She always had brilliant hats and fantastic outfits. You're five on Now, this is available on NET and